Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Stop trying to get something you've already got and start using what you have. Start acknowledging what you have. How foolish, how frustrating would it be for me to sit here and try to get in a chair I'm already in? Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and driven out demons in your name and done many mighty works in your name? And then I will say to them openly and publicly, I never knew you. You better not depend on your church attendance and your good works. I applaud good works and I applaud good church attendance, but he said, I never knew you. That's sad, really. Our problem today is that we have a great deal of knowledge, but very little wisdom. It's amazing, really, the stupidity that's going on in the world today. In the year 2000, 76.6 million people in the United States were enrolled in school. From preschool through college. There's a little variation in the numbers, but they estimate that the education for those people costs $971 billion. So there's a ton of money being spent on education. In 2009, out of all those smart educated people, 1,400,000 of them filed bankruptcy. That was one year. One year. Now, coming here today, I saw a billboard here in your city that made me laugh hysterically for quite a while. <laughs> this is what it said. Whole billboard on the side of the highway. Two words with a little phone number. Affordable bankruptcy. <laughs> I mean, is that not hysterical? Affordable bankruptcy. If you can afford a bankruptcy, then you can afford to pay one of your bills. Good night. And maybe what they'll do is loan you the money to file bankruptcy. So as soon as you file bankruptcy and no longer have any debt, now you have a new debt because you borrowed money to get out of debt. <laughs> For all of the education and the billions of dollars that are spent on education, the current divorce rate is approximately 50% of all first marriages, 67% of all second marriages, and 74% of third marriages. <laughs> I don't want to be negative, but <laughs> if you're getting ready to marry somebody that's already been married three times, I'm not saying it won't work, but if I were you, I'd pray one more time. <laughs> Just maybe one more time. Whoa, Jesus. We're extremely educated, but crime is up, fear is increased, the economy is down, the unemployment rate is up. Stress, stress management is now a multi-billion dollar business. <laughs> The knowledge of everything is available today at our fingerprints, fingertips. The in internet gives instant access to the knowledge of just about everything. However, conditions in the world are rapidly declining. It's like our world is unraveling, coming apart at the seams. And you know why that is? Because people in positions of power are trying to get rid of God. You do not need a panel of experts to figure that out. Yeah, that's right. They don't. They don't get it. And so to tell you the truth, instead of getting mad and, I, can you believe? Well, I don't believe. Well, can you believe? Well, I'm 
we really need to start praying for people to have revelation. I mean, honestly, they don't get it. They really don't get it. You know how, how amazing it is for us to be able to sit here and say, I know God. Oh, Jesus. I mean, that is just wonderful beyond what we can ever imagine. When I get up every morning and I get my coffee and I go up to my little office and I get in my chair and I get all my books and my Bibles and I, I sit there and I just talk to God and I think, I know God. I'm not hopeless. When I get disappointed, I can quickly get reappointed. There's always a new day. <laughs> Amen. When I make a mistake, I can get my forgiveness and not have to feel guilty all day long. I know that God loves me and I'm trying my hardest to teach that to every person on this planet. Because Jesus died for all of us. Begin to pray for people to have a spirit of wisdom and revelation. And especially begin to pray for Christians that they would have revelation of what is theirs in Christ and who they are in Christ. Because we really, by and large, don't know who we are. We're still trying to figure it out. When you know who you are, you never, ever, ever have to compare yourself with anybody else again. You don't have to pray like Sister Mary Jane or Brother Joe. You don't have to do what somebody else does. You don't have to feel bad because John got a promotion and you've been doing the same thing for 30 years. Maybe that's what you're good at and that's what you're happy at. And maybe he's going to be one of the ones putting out half of his money on stress. If you're not anointed for that kind of position, you better just not even want it. When Paul passed through Athens, he saw an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. They knew there was a God, but they considered God to be unknowable. But you can know God. How do you come to know God? Well. I know that sounds like a wonderful phrase, and we're all like, oh, that's yummy. I can know God. <laughs> I could leave you floating on a cloud. I know God. <laughs> but what does that mean? Well, everything spiritual has a practical side. And that's another thing I think we've missed terribly. We teach people all these cloud-floating spiritual things, but don't bring it into a practical level where they know what to do with it in their everyday life. So, to know God means you know His Word. And you know that every word in here is for you. Not for somebody else, it's for you. And to know that God is faithful. And if you will do what you can do, because God's not inviting us to a life of laziness. If you will do what you can do, then God will always do what you cannot do. Do you hear me? You say, well, I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't do that. Don't talk anymore about what you can't do. What can you do? Well, the little bit I can do is not going to make any difference. Do what you can do. And God will do what you cannot do. If you can't pray two hours, pray five minutes. If you can't pray five minutes, pray one minute. Do what you can do. And God will do what you cannot do. People in the Bible that got outrageous miracles were people in pathetic shape that could barely do anything at all. Jesus fed 4,000, 5,000 with a little boy's lunch. The disciples are, well, we don't, we don't, where are we going to get that much bread? Look at all these people. How, how we, gonna, we can't do that. Jesus said, what do you have? What do you have? Well, there's a little boy over here that's got a lunch, and he's got two fish and some bread. <laughs> Jesus said, tell the people to sit down. Give it to me. 
What do you have? Give what you do have to God and stop moaning about what you don't have. What do you have? Amen? Because I can guarantee you, you have something. But you've looked so long at what you don't have that you don't even see what you do have anymore. Amen? I see you guys in that corner. And I see you in the overflows, not really, but I see you in my heart. And I'm so glad you're there. What kind of life have we been called to? What does it mean to say that we're in Christ? And in Ephesians 1, 3, it says, every blessing, every spiritual blessing given in the heavenly realm is ours in Christ. So you don't need to say, I'm going to try to get my blessing. No, you say, I'm blessed. I am blessed in Christ. Amen? Now, I want to look at Philemon chapter 1 and verse 6. And I want to share something with you that I think can be life-changing for you. Philemon 1, 6. Now watch this. And I pray, this is Paul again, and I pray that the participation in and the sharing of your faith may produce, now I'm just going to stop right there for just a minute. Paul's saying, this whole thing we're doing, all of our faith, releasing our faith, it's supposed to produce something, right? So Paul said, I pray that all of this will produce and promote full recognition and appreciation and understanding and precise knowledge, talking about revelation, of every good thing that is ours in our identification with Christ Jesus unto his glory. So Paul is saying, I want you guys to get it. I want you to agree with God. I want you to acknowledge every good thing in you. We're taught to acknowledge our sin, and that's good, but that's not all. We should also be acknowledging our right standing with God. We should be acknowledging that we're justified in Christ. That means just as if we never sinned. We should be acknowledging that we have a blood-bought right to know God, and we will not be denied. We should be acknowledging the power that is ours in Christ. Confessing out loud what the Word of God says is yours in Christ is one of the most powerful things that you can learn to do, and it has been an extremely life-changing thing for me and probably every conference that I do and probably those of you who watch by television you probably don't watch too many programs in a row that I don't say something about our confession and agreeing with God getting into agreement with God it's been scientifically proven that you believe more of what you hear yourself say than you will ever believe of what you hear somebody else say I'm going to say it again. It has been scientifically proven that you will believe more of what you hear yourself say. So if you're looking in the mirror saying, you are dumb and fat. <laughs> if you're going around the house saying, I can never do anything right. What is wrong with me? I can never do anything right. I'm so dumb and so stupid. All I do is foul up. I just mess up all the time. I'm just a big failure. I'm just the person who holds the wall up. No, you need to acknowledge. Paul said, I want this whole faith walk to get you to the point where you acknowledge everything that is yours in Christ. Are you alive out there? Are you in shock? 
Now, when I say what I'm going to say, I am not in any way trying to be rude or unkind to any kind of particular religious organization. I, I was involved in one for a long, long time that, where I learned many, many good things. Many good things. But for me, maybe it was just me, I was not getting what I needed. I got what I needed to go to heaven, but I wasn't getting what I needed to be victorious in my daily life. I had a mess in my life. I'd been sexually abused by my father for many, many years, and just, it was just a horrific mess. And one of the things that we acknowledged each week in church was a, a confession that we were poor, miserable sinners. Um, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess to you all my sins and iniquities with which I've offended you, for which I justly deserve your temporal eternal punishment. All of that is right. Absolutely good. It was a great confession. It's true. We're sinners, deserve to be punished. But there should be more. See, I think if we just stop there, then the story is not finished. I think, I think it would be good if we said, you know, I, I'm, I'm just a poor, miserable sinner without Christ. And I deserve to be punished and die and go to hell, but thank God I can be forgiven and there's no condemnation for those in Christ. And now I've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. And I've been justified in Him, and God loves me unconditionally, and His power is in me and through me and for me, and I've got a great inheritance in Christ. You know, I can be really honest with you, and here again, please understand, I'm, you know, even to be honest, sometimes when I say these kind of things, I know I'm going to take some hits when I do it, but I have to get people that are hungry. To understand that you need to, yes, acknowledge your sins and admit your sins and, and know that you deserve to die and go to hell. The more you know that, the more it makes you amazed about the grace of God. But then go on and acknowledge every good thing that is in you, in Christ. Here's the honest to God's truth. I really didn't need to go and confess that I was a sinner. I already knew that when I got there. I knew I was wretched. I knew I was miserable. That was all that went on in my head 24 hours a day. You are a miserable, wretched person. How could God possibly love you after the way you've lived and what you've done? When I began to see this scripture... Paul said, I pray that your faith would promote and produce in you the acknowledging of all that you are in Christ. <laughs> My God, we've got to get our mouth open with the right stuff. Amen? All right, let's just say you're a little overweight and maybe you're in debt and whatever. You go look at yourself in the mirror and you say, I'm a child of God. And by His grace and power and mercy, I can get out of debt. I can get my house cleaned up. I can lose the weight I need to lose. I can get a good job. I have favor everywhere I go. I refuse to stay like this. This is not my destiny. This is not my inheritance. And I am just not going to sit passively by and say, well, just pour it on. 
I'm just going to try to make it through. I'm under attack, but I'm going to try to make it through till Jesus comes back. Well, it's no wonder we can't lead anybody to Christ. They don't need to just put a Christian label on their misery. Amen? Amen. We need to have joy and peace. Actually, we have it. We need to start using it. We need to let it out. And so this weekend, I'm going to be talking to you more about what's yours in Christ. I'm going to talk to you some about healing in every realm of your being. We must not forget that Jesus is our healer. I'm going to teach you how to wait on God. I'm going to teach you about peace. And you've got all the peace in you that you need to never have to worry another day in your life. You never have to lose another night's sleep because of anxiety and reasoning and fear. You don't have to beg God for peace. You've got peace. Stop trying to get something you've already got and start using what you have. Start acknowledging what you have. How foolish, how frustrating would it be for me to sit here and try to get in a chair I'm already in? All right, let me just finish here. Here's just a few things that are yours just to send you out in a good mood. We are loved. These are all in the Bible. We are loved unconditionally, chosen by God, adopted as his own. We are redeemed. We are forgiven. Please notice I'm saying we are. We are delivered from sin and all of its effects. We have God's favor. We have God's mercy. We are God's heritage, His inheritance, His portion, and we are joint heirs with Christ. God works out everything for our good. Everything that the enemy means for harm, God intends for good. Romans 5 says we are justified and given right standing with God. Romans 5, 9 says we are now justified and brought into right relationship with God. 2 Corinthians 5 says we are new creatures in Christ. Old things have passed away, all things become new. We are the home of God. Romans 8 says there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The kingdom of God, righteousness, peace, and joy is in us. Success, prosperity in every realm of our living is God's will. Everything that we lay our hand to should prosper and succeed. <laughs> we are the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. We lend, but we never have to borrow. So therefore, we never have to file bankruptcy, not even an affordable one. Come on, give God praise. Hallelujah! Woo, I'm so happy I can hardly stand it. I tell you what, God is so good. Now I pray for you that you would have revelation from what I've spoken here tonight. I pray that you would meditate and think about these things and talk to somebody about these things. While you're driving home tonight, that you won't talk about your problems. You'll talk about what you've heard here tonight. That you'll talk about who you are in Christ. And I pray for you, for the peace that passes understanding. I pray that you're going to be so patient, waiting to get out of the parking lot. <laughs> and that you're even going to act like a Christian and let some people go in front of you. Oh, my gosh. We are going to walk in love.
I bless you in Jesus' name. Have a good night. I want to really encourage you to begin to pray on a regular basis for a revelation knowledge of God. Now, you know, it's one thing to know about God. It's another thing entirely to know God. That takes time, and I think it also takes having some experience with God, getting to know His character. It's one thing to have somebody tell you God is faithful. It's another thing entirely to experience the faithfulness of God in your life. And you know, when you really do know God, and you know that you can trust Him, you know that you can depend on Him, and you know that even if you don't understand what He's doing, that He's doing what He's doing because He loves you and because He has some end result in mind that's going to be wonderful, then it gives you courage and it gives you confidence.